Welcome, everyone. This talk is solving an internal real-world SRE issue with Eclipse Trace Compass. I would like to temper your expectations first. I am going to be showing this using Trace Compass Classic, not the soon-to-be superior Trace Compass.cloud. I am showing an internal problem that is being solved. A few things have been anonymized, but um, I would appreciate uh, if you try to take it at the high level. So, without further ado, I am asking that if you have questions, don't hesitate to raise your hand. I will bring out a mic. I will let you answer right away because I hate it when I have a question at slide three and I have to sit on it until the end of the talk. So here is the schedule. We can talk a bit about who I am. What is the problem statement? What is Trace Compass with a basic architecture overview? And how to get data, how to parse said data, how to analyze the data, should we open source the data after? Do you need to modify Trace Compass? And how can we work better together as a community? So first off, about me. So my name is Matthew Kuzam, and I have the privilege of being paid by Ericsson to make the world a better place through open source, and I am incredibly grateful. And I am thrilled to be in a room with like-minded people that also get to make the world a better place through open source. So I, I'm thrilled to see everyone here. Um, I, am, I worked for about 12 years on Trace Compass. I am thrilled to be a member of the board of directors at the Eclipse Foundation and one of the committer reps, which means that if you are a committer or a committer in spirit and you have an issue with the Eclipse Foundation, don't hesitate to flag me down. Um, I am the product owner of Thea, or Eclipse Thea, uh, Eclipse OpenVSX, and Eclipse Trace Compass. I am located in Montreal, um, which means that I basically am more or less over my jet lag today. And I'm a great big old nerd, so I will la gladly talk about most things technical and many things non. So what is the problem statement? And I want to be very clear. This is a problem statement in a large company or on a project with a lot of users. Now, SRE is Site Reliability Engineering. And the metaphor I use is that it's like flossing. If you miss one day, I'm not going to be mad at you, but if you never floss, the dentist is going to be causing, I think the term is minor discomfort, about once a year. So <clears throat> there are always these problems where, oh, gee, it works on my machine. Yeah, so Ericsson is a very large company. It has, last time I checked, around 100,000 employees. And I'm giving a ridiculous lowball estimate. This is below the actual value. But it's, it's a nice round value. 10,000 developers. And a critical service is defined as a service that has about 10% of the developer, uh, that has 10% of the developers using it in their critical workflow. What does critical workflow mean? It means that if it goes down, the engineers just sit there. Now, that means that these engineers are playing free sell at full salary. Well, they're not. They're trying to fix the problem too, but we need to help them, and we need to get things back online fast. Every second of outage it gets costly very fast. So. We have logs, and quite often the citizen admins, they have the instinct to open them. And they do it in Notepad. They do it in Notepad++ if they're feeling cheeky. They, they can do it in, with grep, said awk. Some try using Excel. But let's say that you have a real service with 10,000 users. Your logs, they, they get big. And when I say big, I mean uh, like terabytes. So here is where Eclipse Trace Compass can shine. And uh, I don't see anyone from the Eclipse Foundation here, but if anyone from Eclipse Foundation is watching this afterwards, I'm using the term Trace Compass and Eclipse Trace Compass interchangeably as shorthand. But the product name is Eclipse Trace Compass. So we, uh, 
we have a product called Eclipse Trace Compass, and it's a log and trace visualization application, and it is based on Eclipse technology. It is available in two projects right now, which would be Trace Compass Classic and Trace Compass dot Cloud. Um, normally, I talk about how great using traces and tracing is, but today uh, I'm going on the logging side. Um, show of hands, who here distinguishes traces and logs? Baron, come on, raise your hand. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so the way that we define a trace is structured data that's easily machine readable and a log is unstructured data that's human readable. Traces pretty much always have a timestamp and data per event. A trace is a collection of events. A log can be a story. You know, just think about Star Trek. It always starts with captain's log, and then there's a date, and there's, there's data. But it's not readable by machine. So this is a very important reminder. Trace Compass will not solve any problems. It will not, uh, in computers or otherwise but it can show you where problems exist. So we have a pipeline architecture within Trace Compass, and it's kind of like FFmpeg or basically plugins on plugins. Um, first, we have our data that comes in, and we parse it, we turn it into events, and then we perform analysis or compute on it, and then we display the inferred data in the UI while still retaining all the raw data so that we can give more deep details if you need it. Um, now, we have uh, some really cool caching mechanisms um, and all sorts of stuff like that, and we are leveraging the best technologies that we can on a given platform, or at least what we think are the best technologies. So, you know, it's, it's a pretty mature product. Uh, I've been told that many people consider it to be feature complete, that being said, the big challenge now is the migration, and once you migrate to this new platform with new UI widgets and new ways of working, it's no longer going to be feature complete. It's going to have all the opportunities to make the lives even easier for everyone. But I want to just take a little sidestep and talk about systemic thinking. Now, when you have a problem, you have your data, and you read your data line by line. You're basically leading, reading events. But that's not the full picture. You're basically reading everything out of context. Like, oh, my CPU temperature is 93 degrees. OK, that's bad. But if you look at events together, you get trends. And trends are not the, solo, uh, are not the full picture either. Oh, my CPU temperature is going up. Oh, that, that, that's bad. And then you have trends. I, I would call them one-dimensional. Events are zero-dimensional. You take trends and you correlate them together, you get two-dimensional data. And now you can start seeing patterns. Oh, my computer gets to 95 degrees whenever I'm, whenever I'm talking to my friend on, um, on a messenger. That's bad. And then you look at the, and if you take a bunch of patterns and you correlate them together, then you get four-dimensional data, uh, not, not like X, Y, Z time, but four-dimensional data. And these are behaviors. These are what you really need to fix. Oh, my computer hits, hits 95 degrees when I'm zooming with a friend because I like zooming with my friend under my pillow fort. That's your problem right there. So here's an example. There's a faulty app. Um, and uh, this one was diagnosed with Trace Compass. It was, and I only used the OS level trace, about 999 per mil of the time was spent setting the frequency on CPU zero. The program was on CPU three. Now, the reason it was setting CPU zero was that they were using a library that didn't take the CPU as argument, but that said it could frequency up everything but then it was monitoring only CPU three. So it was in this endless loop. Um, the bug was filed, the problem was solved, but the pattern is that 
when you're not pinned to that CPU, you are accessing your CPU frequency and setting the CPU frequency constantly, which freezes the UI thread. The behavior was that CPU zero was hard coded, and that is what needed to get fixed. And to the credit of the teams that did it, it was fixed. So here's a second real world example, and this one is the internal one. Um, we have this app, and it's a very good app. It's one of my favorite apps, and, or cloud service, and all of a sudden it was being a distributed denial of service attacked. Now, so I'm just gonna give you the answer right now because I don't want you trying to guess too much. I want you just to enjoy the journey. There were some plugins that changed their behavior and together scaled to 10,000 or 50,000. It became a problem. So, you know, this is one of those classic, it works on my machine, but when it gets bigger, it stops working. We were called in, and by called in, I mean that I really was saying, come on, let us help, let us help. And we actually got some really interesting data out of it. So they were saying yeah, it's impossible to read. There's over 10 gigs of logs and, uh, per day, and there's three years of data that they backed up. We did our data acquisition then. They, they did a good job logging for us. And after that, we saw that their logs were Apache logs, which are defined. That, that was a really nice present for us. And the team was using, they weren't using Notepad, they're good. They're using grep, set, and awk. But grep, set, and awk will be able to show you events, and if you're lucky, trends. Not patterns, not behaviors. So the first thing we did was we created a parser. Now, we um, basically uh, have our log standard, and we didn't even need to make our, um, our regular expression because someone on the internet already did. Uh, by the way, more on that and software provenance later. So here's a quick demo. Um, I need to... So with Trace Compass, what I did was I went and I'm going to go here. So here we have our custom text, um, our custom text wizard. This has been in Trace Compass for what, like nine years now? It's one of the greatest features that very few people use. And you can basically take your code here. Or what we did was we did head. We could have used tail on our given log. And then we copy it, or copy some of the output, and we paste it into there, into this text box. And just a little hint, I, when, I, when I have to make my own regexes, I find this editor <laughs> to be so useful. Um, not, even, not just for Trace Compass, but just in general, because it highlights in real time, it's lightweight, so now you see that dot star actually parses this. That, that's a good start. Now I got the regex, I put it in, and all of a sudden we can see our groups are highlighted, and the first one is green because it is defined, and it's purple and not defined. So now we set the first one to be the IP, because it's an IP. And you go to other, and then it makes a field. Every field becomes a column here, and every column can help for a given analysis. So that is how it was working. I'm going to just fast forward a bit. You can see that it parsed. And that would be it for that demo. Just know that it literally took under 10 minutes to get a parser going on something that was completely alien to us because we did our jazz hands onto Google. And now we've got to analyze the data. 
when you want to analyze the data, I really think it's a good idea to figure out what you want to show. You need to have that end goal so that you can walk in the right direction. So here's a little, um, we have three kinds of views that we can show in Trace Compass. We have data tables, we have XY charts, and we have Gantt charts. If you're thinking of spans, if you want to have data that is contiguous, as in A, then B, something that's stateful, consider using Gantt charts. If you want to see trends, KPIs, things that will evolve and you want to see the difference between them, XY charts, which by the way, um, are based on the amazing SWT chart library, um, will be uh, your choice. And if you want to look at statistics or aggregate data, tables are going to be a very good selection. Now, danger about tables. We all have the impulse to go deep. You, if you're doing tables, you really want to aggregate things because you don't want to send an email with 500 entries. So, like, this is uh, something where you need to consider what's going on and what you want to do. So, we wanted to create some XY charts because we had data over a day, and in a day, you really don't, you want to find, you want to find that pin, that needle in the haystack. So, you're not going to go for Gantt. Gantt will explain what's happening, XYs will explain where it's happening. And, Show of hands, who's unable to read the tiny text? Good, you don't need to read it. Here's the part that's important. 46 lines for one, two, three XY charts with a copyright header with SPDX. This is not a complicated language. However, it is not an obvious language. And if anyone here wants to suggest a, another way forward on this kind of language because this is a DSL. And I'm thinking out loud, GLSP, a GLSP editor could be really cool. You know, we want to play with you. So now, I'm going to do a quick demo of, or, and by demo I mean another video of our investigation. So we loaded the given, um, I'm going to just fast forward because we didn't have, or we did an event count analysis, which is built in. We looked at our density. And you see here, we have an outage. It's pretty obvious. There's another outage here. We selected this and we looked at our event density to figure out what's going on during the outage. Also, uh, Trace Compass is a pig when it comes to memory usage. It's about 88 megabytes for a um, 2 gigabit file. Uh, this was a 5 gigabyte trace. So, you know, like, have at least 128 megs of RAM. In reality, I, I recommend a gig, just, just for safety purposes, but jokes aside, we try really hard to be as efficient as possible on this. Here, we have the XML file that I showed that we loaded. And once it's loaded, oh yeah, now we're loading the external analysis script, but you can see we have a throughput analysis that came to the list. From that you can load it, and you can view the results. What we did instead was we looked and surprise, there's no app.erickson.com, I just added that. And here are some user IDs which Oh, what's, what's that? Huh. Oh, it's bad guy. But bad guy is not the bad guy. Look, you have 75,000 messages or 75,000 events from bad guy. Who's the real bad guy? That's at 14 million requests in one hour. Anonymous. Now, when we found that out, I'm going to stop the video here because I think I'm going to run a little short on time and I would much rather have questions and interactions with you guys than watching a video with you guys. Um, I want to know, 
Once we found that out, we were able to infer, or we were able to find out that Anonymous was always doing the same thing. And the same thing was that it was checking one plugin's help file. And then when we found out that it was that plugin's help file, we were able to dig in the configuration of the, um, of the um, runners, because we found that it was Jenkins that was launching this. The help file was commented, is this service alive? So basically, there was, they didn't use the keep alive. They used the help file. And then, why did they use the, then, it was really probably one brilliant person that did it, and that made a nice library out of it, and then it got copied, and copied, and copied, and copied, and copied, and copied. At the end, you have 50,000 jobs. You end up hammering it about 300 times a second, and here's the kicker. Here's what made everything break, because it was fine. You had this 800-byte help file that was downloaded 300 times a second. Yeah, like an Intel Atom can do that. You know what it can't do? The help file was updated because the developer is also an artiste. They added a picture of a thumbs up, which changed the file size from 800 bytes to 300 kilobytes. All of a sudden, the 50,000 people querying 300 times a second for like 10,000 times more data was too much for this service. And by the way, this service was not on a lightweight machine, right? So this was accounting now for 80% of the traffic on the service. And once it was clear what happened, it was fixed, but now we fixed the trend, we fixed the pattern, we're still working on fixing the behavior. The behavior being that we need to make sure that people understand the impact of their code, they need to understand the trans they need to have more transparency, and this is not the job of the trace team per se, but we are helping in any way we can. So I have a question. We finished the investigation. We committed our patches to Garrett. And I, no one from Eclipse Foundation, I love Garrett at Eclipse, and I'm very sad to see it go, but I do understand things are changing. Um, after, um, after we have the um, Garrett, uh, we have it in our Git. I want to know from the crowd, how would you like sharing recipes? Because everything we did so far and I'm going to show it now very quick. I think the next slide is demo, yes. It's almost as if I practiced. So we have our trace compass. Now, let's say that you want to um, export your log. You go to export trace package. And the cool thing is then it will take the caches also. Did I say two gigs? I meant five. Um, and the supplementary caches here, which are one extra gig. And uh, yeah, it's by default in tar, but you can zip it and then it's much smaller. If you want to export your parsers, you can go to um, manage custom parsers and then you can edit, export. And it will also uh, be able to output it. Now, the parser outputs to an XML. Then there's manage XML analysis. This was the DSL based thing that I showed. And here what you can do is once again click on it and export. And all of these files can be zipped together, put in an email, so that your friend or not so much friend can open these traces with the exact same environment and in exact same instructions as you have. Hello, tooltip. So yeah, I want to know, yes, uh, one second, I'm going to give you a mic. So you wanted uh, insight on how to share the recipes. Yeah. Wouldn't it be easier for parser, rather than having an XML export, to have uh, some kind of uh, marketplace where you can share your parsers and get other parsers? Well, absolutely. This was these. OK, so did everyone hear the question? Show of hands. 
Okay, the question was, can we put this in a marketplace? Can we have a freeform marketplace? That is a very interesting thing, and right now what we're doing, I'm suggesting we put it within Git, the Git of the incubator, which is kind of like a marketplace. I'll just show very quickly. Uh, please understand that this is a project in debug, uh, that was compiled in debug, so that you don't have all the menus. But this is the Trace Compass marketplace, and the parsers are here, along with a lot of really cool features, by the way. So we do have it in a marketplace, but we, like, I want to make it as easy as possible for contributors, because we did, there are studies that normally you have 0.1% of the people that generate these parsers and the rest that consume. And I want to make that 0.1% as easy to get, make another 99.9%. So, let's say you have to modify Trace Compass. I want to give you, like, there are some things that can be um, problems. Uh, I'll, one example I had was that I got the logs from, I, I work at Ericsson, I got the logs that were in Swedish time zones. And since I was in Canada, our time zone is six hours off. So, I made a quick patch to the uh, parser to allow times, uh, different time zone, not to use the local time zone, but to be able to specify your time zone. Now, this is, um, you know, there are, in human languages, this can be ambiguous. Why? We were lucky. These traces had the time zone. What if someone says, if you look at syslog, you don't have the GMT plus two or uh, UTC minus three or something. So, you know, we had to make a concession. We put a patch up onto Garrett. But if you have found things that are problems and you fix them locally, you know, it, it's a good idea to share it. Now, I'll give you, I'll give you a non a uh, generous, a very selfish reason to share it. If there is an SRE problem, and there are thousands of people waiting for you, do you really want to take the time to rebase your patch and reapply it to the latest trace compass? You know, if it's already in the Git, everything's rebased on it instead. So, really, when there's an SRE issue, seconds can be thousands of dollars. If something is going down, you really need the best tool for the job. If you are a wizard at grep, by all means use it. However, um, I consider, and I want to preface, I consider as a developer of Trace Compass and as the product owner of Trace Compass, that Trace Compass is an amazing tool for these kind of problems. Um, and I do have experimental, even though anecdotal, evidence to prove it. Now, um, the elephant in the room, of course, is Excel. Excel kind of suffers after a million lines. So, you know, this is, um, it's really good for giving to managers cherry-picked data. And this is very important because you need to explain the root cause so that the problem doesn't come back two days later, or even worse, when you're on vacation. And I do hope you all take vacations. So, yeah. I guess what I'm trying to say is Trace Compass lets you take vacations. So some reminders. Eclipse Trace Compass is fr uh, fast, free to use, and we want to hear your use cases. We want to work with you. We want to have a community. And if you want to contribute fixes to Trace Compass, uh, they will be in your system before the next outage. But you know, if you have bugs and questions, that's also contributions. So here's some contact info. There's a Trace Compass, the website, which is eclipse.org slash Trace Compass. Um, then there's uh, the at Trace Compass on Twitter. Um, here's my personal contact. I hope that I'll see you soon, but oh, one more thing. We now have the, we got the permission to make a YouTube page. The videos are three minutes long, 
We're trying to make them easy to digest so that they, you can, um, so it's good for the attention span while you're stuck in an elevator or something. Thank you very much. Now, I know I've been crystal clear, but are there any questions? Self-fulfilling prophecy. Well, we have three minutes to go before um, I'm forcibly ousted from the room. I'm okay uh, cutting, oh, yes. Can you pass it down, please? Don't worry, I will repeat your question too. I'm not really familiar with, with Trace Compass, so uh, uh, we have been using different tools for mm -hmm. similar purposes. So in the, the past, maybe um, uh, Elk, the Elk stack, yes. and maybe more recently, recently Fluent D plus uh, Grafana charts. Mm -hmm. So maybe what are the oh, this unique is a, selling points? That this is a make really us good question there. So the question is, how would you compare Elk, Grafana, and Trace Compass. And I would say that in terms of monitoring, Elk and Grafana are a million light years ahead of Trace Compass. In terms of, in terms of problem analysis, and I'm biased, I am very biased, I think that is not their mission. Their mission is to give an overview, like a thumbs eye view of what's going on. Deep dive investigations are less verbose and they show more inferred data so they can lead you into false positives. Um, the reason that they, they are for monitoring, so data constantly coming in. Trace Compass is for post-mortem investigations, which means something bad happened, you need the giant magnifying glass and the Sherlock Holmes hat. And so because of that, I also personally find Trace Compass to be fun because it's always a murder mystery. Uh, Follow-up question then. Yes. No? If we are, well, if you, we are aggregating all the logs in Elasticsearch or anywhere else, what would be the best way then to make these logs available for analysis with trace compass if something bad happens. Okay. Do, do we need to have also backups of the log files somewhere? Because you know in, in Kubernetes you normally log to standard out and then use something like FluentD to aggregate and yes. in Elasticsearch or elsewhere. So your question is, where do we keep the logs? Because trace compass is not a logger, it's not a tracer, it's just visualizing. Just like Grafana, just like Kibana. But, you know, Grafana has Logstash, and um, what, what, what was the stack for Grafana again? It's like Prometheus, something. Uh, FluentDB, I guess. Hmm? Fluent. FluentDB or InfluxDB, one of the two. Yeah. I think it's FluentD, which basically yeah. takes the standard out of the containers and, and pushes it to Elasticsearch, for example. Yes. And then Gafana provides visualization on top of that. So you don't really have normally the logs anymore because you log to standard out. If the container crashes, you lose the log unless it's archived in something like Elasticsearch. And in that case, uh, so if the data is archived to Elasticsearch, and if you can't find the data using Kibana, or the issue using Kibana, you would need to export the data from Elasticsearch. Now, what you could do, I do know that you can export to um, CSV, and that's actually very easy to make regex parsers for. Um, if there is a need for something more structured, like a JSON parser, we have the groundwork, but we don't have a wizard to do this, so that means that you need to do a bit of Java code. I'm not I don't like that because I don't want you to do Java code when there's other people suffering. So if, if you have any ideas on how to make a, J a JSON parser that's generic, I'm super open for that one. <laughs> but yeah, you basically need to get the data out. 
And one joke I give is that Trace Compass is good on medium data. Because little data is data that fits all in RAM. And honestly, that's not interesting as a problem. Um, big data doesn't fit on a hard disk. Medium data fits on the hard disk, but not your RAM. And you saw that was where we were taking 100 megs while reading 5 gigs. That's, that's where we really shine. We were very, very detail-oriented in terms of uh, memory consumption and scalability. Any other questions? OK. Well, thank you. Please don't forget to vote. I will be reading everything. <laughs>